Hey everyone, Dave Keller here. Welcome to the final bar. We're talking market recovery. I feel like every day it's a little different. Today it's all about the upside after President Trump's comments, speculation about uh, bailouts and such and uh, support from the Fed. Markets certainly reacting to the upside. We're going to unpack a number of technical themes. Uh, joined by my guest Rob Slimer from Fundstrat. Can help us think about where there might be opportunity. Also, some of the breadth characteristics. So ladies and gentlemen, this is the final bar. Hello, everyone. Welcome to today's show, The Final Bar. I want to thank you for joining us every weekday after the close to look at the markets through the technical lens, connect the short-term movements today with the long-term. And boy, if you're not comfortable with volatility yet, I hope, <laughs> hope you are now because today was another uh, violent change of direction after yesterday's uh, weakness, yesterday's digesting of previous uh, losses. Today, we revert back to the upside with a big move in the S&P. Uh, you know, the questions we're going to talk about in the mailbag relate to sort of navigating this bottoming period. And uh, I'll be honest with you, this is challenging and working, you know, talking with a lot of my peers in the industry. These are not easy markets to navigate. The good news is I think this is where charts are more helpful than anything. A lot of people fall in the trap of, uh, you know, what should happen, what should work as opposed to what is actually working. And that's where charts can be really helpful. They tell you what's happening. You can't change, uh, can't change the charts. Uh, getting to our, our upcoming events here on this show and on Stock Charts TV. Tomorrow, we have uh, guest Pat Ceresno from the Market Huddle podcast. They went on their show uh, on Friday. I had a really good conversation with them. I'm happy to have Pat here on the final bar. Uh, also, tomorrow, we'll be releasing our latest special, Navigating a Bear Market. I saw some of the previews of uh, contributions from my fellow Stock Charts contributors. You're not going to want to miss this lens into each of their processes and how they're approaching this, uh, this market environment. Then on Thursday, we have Matt Maley from Miller Tabak in the uh, Boston area. And uh, also our next edition of Behind the Charts will be Jonathan Krinsky, uh, who's a uh, longtime technical analyst, also a former golf professional. So it'd be interesting to, uh, to get his background and experience. Let's get right into the market. So, you know, uh, this market has been, uh, been uh, you know, illustrated through increased volatility, through sudden changes of directions, through significant moves. And it's all about the news flow that's coming out, and it's all about how the market reacts uh, reacts to that. Um, you know, so here, for example, we have the S and P 500 after a day when it was struggling after uh, you know recent days where it's more distributive than uh, the, than accumulation. Uh, you're finding a situation where the S and P's up, you know, almost 10 percent today, and a lot of that came uh, sort of in the last little clip toward the end. Uh, if we look at the last uh, you know couple of days here, this was yesterday uh, yesterday's trading on Monday you know, new lows, new closing lows, and plenty of choppiness, and then we kind of gap right back up. I think it's interesting to note just in the short term that, uh, you know, we sort of uh, rallied back up to this resistance area, this uh, level around 245 or, or so on the uh, spiders is where we found resistance toward the uh, sort of the second half of last week, sort of Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, all peaked out in the same similar area. So, while one day feels good and while a 9% gain certainly doesn't hurt, uh, you know, where we're at relative to some of those movements, I think is gonna be, is gonna be really key. And again, a lot of this moved right into the last minutes of the, uh, of the trading day, but uh, it's worth noting that mid caps were actually up over 10%, the Dow up over 11%, so really the biggest, uh, the biggest gainer of them all. The VIX still fairly elevated, but uh, less so than before, just above 61. In terms of sector movements, right, so you had a big uh, reaction rally from energy. These are names like Exxon and Chevron. We talked to them about them recently about as dividend plays, but one of the, you know, conversations we had on Friday's mailbag, we were talking about the ability of those companies to maintain their dividends. And what happened today is you had a lot of stocks like Chevron, for example, you know, sort of reaffirming that they were not planning on cutting their dividends. They're cutting in other areas, but keeping their dividend where it is, which makes it a, you know, pretty compelling yield opportunity and that among other things pushes energy up over 16 percent today that's followed by industrials 
and financial. So today was about those stocks that have been sort of on the lower end of the uh, of the curve, all sort of getting a boost from you know potential expectation that uh, we'd get some recovery, that we'd get an economic recovery. Uh, you know, President Trump talking about you know reopening the country, getting back to work, and all of that. And, and again, I don't want to speculate too much on those particular comments, but the charts are certainly reflecting a renewed optimism in some of those themes coming back. On the downside, you have some of those plays that have been sort of the disaster plays, the coronavirus plays, things like healthcare, communication services, consumer staples. These are the companies that are going to help us get through an extended uh, sort of shutdown of society. So, you know, today this movement sort of is a meme reversion back to things might be okay as opposed to uh, the end of the world, which is what the charts have been telling us uh, before. In terms of stock movements, you know, it's really interesting to see some of the transports um, sort of in the upper end. Uh, so you have things like in, uh, airlines, which were one of the top groups up over 20% today. Again, these are coming out of very, very low levels. Uh, but again, a lot of, uh, you know, as, as plans materialize for a recovery from, uh, uh, from Congress, a, uh, a stimulus package of sorts, a bailout package, um, airlines, others that have been hardest hit, will certainly, uh, you'd expect to see some upside from there. Also, you see the automobiles group, all of these coming off of pretty uh, pretty low levels, and others within consumer discretionary, like furnishings, like home construction. These have been some of the the underperforming groups really rallying uh, pretty well. Uh, also, that it was interesting to note, materials actually one of the better uh, you know some of the better groups. Sector up more than the market, but not significantly. But if you look, things like aluminum were up uh, huge today, uh, up almost thirty percent. So some of these, and these are groups you're probably less familiar with, but uh, but certainly uh, rallied pretty uh, pretty well. So what was down on, on a day where everything felt sort of up? Not much. Mortgage REITs were the only ones that were, uh, that were, uh, that were down on an absolute price basis uh, with our Dow Industry Universe, about 100-odd uh, uh, groups. But you see some of the others, broadline retailers, for example, still at the lower end of the relative picture, if you think of uh, their recovery relative to, uh, to others. In terms of uh, ETFs and global markets, you'll see some of the commodity-oriented ETFs doing pretty well here. Canada, Australia, Brazil. Um, on the downside, you had uh, you had others, but you know certainly uh, again a lot of the the theme that I'm I'm seeing here with a lot of these movements is sort of that move back to um, the re the recovery theme. You know, just sort of finishing off this recap before we answer some of the questions from the mailbag. I've, I've brought up this chart before. This is the uh, market trend model I've been following for. Uh, a number of years, uh, you know, again, this is based on very long-term moving averages, the 20, 21 and 34 week exponential moving averages. I started following these, you know, during sort of the bear, you know, secular bear markets in the 2000s to, uh, you know, the late 2000s when you had a number of those bear market turns. And this indicator sort of kept you out of the extended bear market. And it wasn't just the price movement, it was the time component. What's happened recently is the market sold off so quickly that it takes a while for a model like this to react. And what's interesting is if we would close the week here, which again, we have not closed yet. So a lot of things could happen. But, you know, if things remain about where they are, um, this would be a sell signal from that model. The last time it turned negative was sort of the beginning of December of 2018, which was not long before the actual uh, bottom there. Uh, you know, once the market recovered, it turned back bullish in, uh, in February of 2019. But you know, finally turned negative when we broke to new swing lows. I think it was very interesting to note, actually just would, would turn negative here. So again, we'll have to see how things actually play out if this is the beginning of a bottoming process or a little deeper one. My guest, uh, Rob Slimer, is gonna hopefully help us answer some of those, uh, some of those questions. Looking at a daily chart of the S&P, you know, again, what I would remind everyone, you know, one day is going to fluctuate greatly, and we've seen an increase in volatility on pretty much any chart that I've looked at recently. And uh, stocks, commodities, bonds, uh, doesn't matter. Um, so the key is all about the trend, right? So when I'm looking at the chart of the S&P, I'm looking at the, the highs from the last week. As we saw from just that five-day look back, you can see the last day here has rallied and pushed us back up to the resistance that we saw from last week. That was after that leg down going into last week. Uh, which felt like sort of a, uh, you know, stability area before the sell-off uh, yesterday on Monday. So again, I would love to see us get above those highs if we see follow through tomorrow. That could suggest that this might be a little more of a backing and filling sort of experience if 
However, we go back and retest some of those lows, which I think, I, I can't imagine that the bottom would be in without retesting the lows in some meaningful way. Um, whether that happens tomorrow, I don't, I don't know as much as anyone else doesn't. Um, but we'll have to see if, if we're able, to, in the short term, able to reclaim the highs from last week would be pretty compelling. This bullish divergence continues to, you know, continues to diverge. But again, it's hard to use that as a particular timing tool only because if the market would continue lower, that divergence would continue to, um, to, uh, to evolve that way. Just to finish off our market re recap, I just want to point out the breadth picture. Again, when I'm thinking of breadth, it's all about the underlying movements that make up the index overall. And what I'm seeing right now from the cumulative advanced decline lines, and again, this is not updated for today. So we'll see an uptick in this because of all the markets that rallied pretty well today. But how much of an uptick and does it really change this cumulative picture? That's the real question. And, and as I mentioned before, until we start to see a positive rotation um, from that accum cumulative advanced decline line across the board, I think we have to just expect that this is the beginning of a process and not getting to any resolution of that bottoming process. We need to continue on to our next segment, which is the final bar mailbags. What we love to do is take your questions, uh, send in via email, also on Twitter. As a reminder, you can uh, hit us on email, the final bar at stockcharts.com or at Twitter on, uh, sorry, on Twitter at final bar SCTV or my uh, Twitter handle is at dkellercmt and uh, hit me with questions there. This first question actually comes to us from uh, Twitter and it said, great show for uh, for the future reference, if we get a rally, do you expect the coronavirus stocks like Zoom and Regeneron to underperform? And what sectors do you expect to overperform or outperform? Um, it's a really good question and, and a timely question with what we saw today, right? So I think when you, you know, leading up to today, we have sort of this coronavirus bucket and it's a lot of the stocks that have been in the, in the top uh, decile or top, uh, you know, uh, 10 names or 20 names in the scooter reports. Uh, and it's sort of those coronavirus stories. It's things like the biotechs, Gilead, Regeneron. It's, um, you know, stay at home stories like Netflix. It's work from home stories like Zoom, like Citrix. Um, and, uh, and, and then also sort of the staples, things like um, um, Clorox and others that would, uh, you know, cleaning supplies, uh, staples and, and so forth. What's happened today is if you look, that theme has unwound a little bit. And again, consumer staples were up. It's not like they were down and it's not like people were taking, were rotating away from them, but this was certainly more of a move more toward a broader recovery. So I think, you know, the, the real question, if we get a rally, what would I expect? My number one answer to that would don't bet on what should happen. Look at the charts and, and bet on the charts that are outperforming, you know, leading out of that bottoming period. That's where I would want to be. Um, semiconductors come to mind as something that's started to rally really nicely. The relative performance of semiconductors has been impressive. Technology as a whole has been, has been impressive. Um, and so I would expect that to continue to be a theme. Um, you know, in a recovery period, I think it would depend on what, what causes that recovery, right? Um, I would think a lot of those, uh, you know, coronavirus plays are, are speculation of a, of a longer drawn out recovery period. So something like Zoom, Citrix services, it's how much are we going to need to, you know, run our businesses remotely. And when you get back to work, when you get back to your office and everything's fine, how much do you still need to use some of those products? It's going to be the real question if they have staying power. But I would bet, you know, I would guess if I had to, to decide what would outperform, it's going to be those things that are, uh, that have been beaten down so much. It's going to be things like, Airlines, uh, energy, especially banks. If we get to a period of stability, you would see those uh, potentially leading out, leading out of the way. So again, today I think you see one one piece of that. But more often than not, I would uh, or, or always, if possible, I would I would be looking at the charts, particularly about the relative strength. Really good question, though. Second question: um, Technical analysts are sometimes talking about intraday breadth. What do you think they are using as intraday breadth? What's a good tool for measuring it? Um, and uh, and would, is intraday breath helpful for uh, longer term analysis? Would you look at intraday breath as more of a longer term gauge? I, I summarized that question um, so quickly, so sorry for that, uh, that I did that. So, um, you know, my question, my answer on breath, you know, I, I think it depends, right? In general, I don't tend to like, um, you know, using short term breath indicators to make long term uh, conclusions. I think in general, you want to be looking at longer term breadth to make longer term conclusions. And that's why the breadth I tend to look at is like this. It's looking at cumulative lines. So if you, if you notice, most of my charts involve cumulative measures of breadth. They don't look at uh, intraday measures of breadth. As a matter of fact, I don't know how many intraday real measures of breadth I really have on here. I really don't. 
um, things like the Trim Index and others I've, uh, I've certainly followed at times. Those tend to be short-term reads, trying to identify when there are quick fluctuations uh, in breadth during the trading day. Um, if there's an intraday breadth measure that I do use, it would be up and down days. Um, and so if I'm looking here at stocks making new highs and new lows, that's one that I would look at. And so it, that really is looking at a daily snapshot of stock making, stocks making new highs, new lows. That's not a cumulative measure or anything. So seeing where the extremes get relative to previous extremes, I think that's really helpful. Same thing with up and down volume. You know, what's the volume on up stocks versus down stocks? Um, you know, what percent of stocks, if you look at the advanced decliners, is the percent advanced decliners. Today, we had a 90% up day after a series of 90% down days. That is maybe the most common measure of intraday breadth that I would use uh, for drawing some longer term conclusions. But in general, you see the breadth that I use. It's more based on cumulative measures. Finally, what are the best ways to identify an equity bottom in the U.S. market? Oh, that's such a great question. That, that alone could be, a, uh, could be a, an entire special. I would remind everyone tomorrow we've got that special navigating a bear market where hopefully you'll get that question answered from a number of my fellow uh, stock charts contributors. Um, you know, what are the ways to do it? I, I think there are a couple of ways. You know, for me, one of the main ways I would look at um, is looking at, the, uh, looking at the price of the S&P itself. And for me, you know, there's a lot of speculation, certainly in a period of extreme volatility, to draw a lot of um, short, draw long-term conclusions from the short-term movements, right? Today, the market's up 9, 10%. That means the recovery is here. I would remind you the last time we had one of those days was right about here, which was a big up day. And then the next day was a huge gap down. We then had another big up day and another big gap down. So in the context of the last couple of weeks of a essentially a raging, crippling downtrend, you've had some big eight to 10% gainers along the way there. So I would caution people to draw long-term conclusions from the intraday movements. A lot of times things are gonna be reactions to news flow and all of that, especially in this sort of environment, but don't forget to pay attention to the longer term trend. And for me, it's all about the peaks and the valleys. Are we making higher highs or lower lows? Even with today's recovery, we're still making lower highs in the S&P. And until that pattern changes, the downtrend is, is, is in place, right? The trend is down. And that is not a qualitative measure. That is not an opinion. That is by definition. Until we get a higher peak, until the S&P gets above uh, the peak from, uh, you know, the, that we made sort of mid last week, the trend remains lower. If we do make a new swing high, which would be the first step, I would then be looking at the next low and you need to be making some sort of higher low. Once those two things happen, I think you can start making a valid argument for a bottoming process that's starting to be uh, in play. Until then, it's certainly... Uh, more speculation. That would be one. The second thing I would say would be in terms of uh, breadth measures, right? So if I'm looking at the um, uh, my my uh, mindful investor chart list, I you know this is the second chart. I've, I've brought this up so many times, and and that's the reason because until you see the cumulative advance lines uh, turning up, a lot of the broad movements in the S and P will be based on different themes and and how things are moving, fluctuating day to day. But this tells you the trend. This tells you the overall picture, and overall the picture has remained weaker rather than uh, than stronger. Um, thanks for that question. Again, I, I, I feel like we could do a lot more in terms of uh, spending more time on that. We'll talk as a, as a Stock Charts TV team and see what we can do for you. Thanks so much for our questions. That's our mailbag for today. We're going to take a quick commercial break. Be back with my guest, Rob Slimer from Fundstrat. See you in a minute.
Hey everyone, welcome back to the show. This is Dave Keller with Stock Charts. Thanks as always for watching The Final Bar every day after the close. Uh, please keep your questions, your feedback coming to us. The Final Bar at StockCharts.com is the best way to get a hold of us. We'd love to answer your questions for one of our future shows. But at this point, I want to bring on my guest, Rob Slimer. Rob is the technical analyst at Funstrat in the New York area. I've uh, followed Rob's work for a number of years, consider him a, uh, a good friend. And it's a pleasure, Rob, to have you on the show today. Thanks for having me, Dave. So you set a couple charts ahead of time, and, and uh, I've, I've mentioned other people before. Uh, I remember in my Fidelity days watching the quadrant balance oscillator, actually watching breadth from a different angle. So what can you just introduce people to this methodology? What is it telling you right now? Sure. So in the top panel, what we're looking at is the S&P 500. It's a weekly chart going back to about 1986. In the bottom panel, that's the quadrant balance indicator. What is it? It's a measure of the percentage of stocks with rising weekly momentum. So think about an indicator like MACD or stochastics, and you took all the stocks in the market and added up where they were on those stochastic curves or MACD curves. This is the COPIC curve that I use. I've used it for about 28 years or so, and I find it pretty useful. So what we're looking at uh, in the very right-hand side, we're in those orange dotted uh, rectangle, yeah, exactly there, is that the quarter balance is now down at 1.2%. So think about that. That is the percentage of stocks with rising weekly momentum is less than 1% or less than 2% in the market. That's a very, very low number. And we can see where, those, uh, where that, that level of um, uh, stocks below the, below, uh, sorry, with rising weekly momentum has been below 5% is every time uh, where those green arrows are and where the green bars are. And it doesn't happen that often. Now, granted, the sample set's not very big, but if you look in the top panel, that tends to be around or close to market lows. So one of the things we did is, what do the four returns look like? Uh, if we go to the next slide, what do the four returns look like when this indicator is below 10%? So on the right, on the left-hand side, the that return profile, that green line, shows us what the return is 12 weeks out, and roughly, call it 70% of the time, the market's up somewhere in the range of two, three, four percent. But when it's on the right-hand side, when that, that indicator is below 5% you still get a positive return around 60% of the time, but it's very muted. And it really just reinforces what we think is happening here. An internal low in the market is trying to develop the VIX's peaks and whatnot. And the return profile is going to be very choppy looking out over the next two to three months or so. But we think the market, like many other major market lows, it takes time for that to develop. So really, so you know, the next question is, oh, sorry, Dave. No, I was just going to say, so it's, it seems to me, I, I love this uh, approach to it, and it, it, it's in line with what I think we've talked about on the show before. It, we're, we're, at the, we're in a bottoming process, but in the beginning of what could be a, a choppy but bottoming process. Does that sound about fair? That's exactly right. I mean, we don't know for sure. Nobody does. But if we look at prior market lows, and every time is different, but historically, you sort of build an internal low where you start to see some divergences. We're starting to see that in some areas, some areas that are starting to bottom, at least tactically. We don't know if they're long-term lows. I think they are, but at least tactically, we're starting to see some evidence of that. Now, having said that, the question in, in a lot of people's minds is where do you go now, right? So you mentioned one group that could be looking as a, as a potential, uh, with potential upside here. What are you seeing about semiconductors? Yeah, so the semis are such an important bellwether as, as an overall uh, gauge for cyclicality in the market or cyclicals in general. And, you know, I think a lot of the garbage bounces harder first, right? We see that with uh, bank stocks and energy stocks. But the semis came right down to the 200 week. That's always a very long term uh, support level. You can see that on the left hand side where that blue arrow is. So that's getting into the zone of support. And on the right hand side, in the top panel, that daily momentum data is oversold. And in the third panel from the bottom, you see that relative strength starting to build to the upside. So I think for anybody that wants to trade and wants to be a little bit more aggressive on the long side, I think this is a very interesting area to be. So it, it's fantastic, three fantastic charts, uh, Rob, and thank you again for, for sharing with these. If I could just finish with one question, you know, what, what would you see that would maybe convince you that this bottoming process thesis is wrong? Is there a certain pain point or a certain threshold on the S&P that would tell you to revisit it? Is it a change in breadth characteristics, or is it certain groups that are doing well or poorly? What, what would tell you that there's actually much more downside than you might expect? I think if we started to see things that have been sort of steady leadership through this correction, like technology, really start to take a nosedive. If Microsoft and Apple obviously such massive bellwethers, uh, their relative strength starts to crater here. Mm. And their price profiles fail to dig in as an, as an overall uh, oversold condition. 
that would get me concerned. Those are great. It's a great take and three great charts. Rob Slimer from Fundstrat, thank you so, so much for coming on the show today. We appreciate it. Thanks very much, Dave. All right, everyone. That was Rob Slimer from uh, Fundstrat. I've followed his work for a number of years. And again, it's, it's interesting how some of his take has lined up with some of the things we've been talking about, about the breadth characteristics, lining up with some of the, you know, the, the early days of a bottoming process. What I've learned from Rob over the years is focusing on relative strength and the value of that. So I love the chart of, uh, of semiconductors, uh, certainly seeming to, to remain leadership in this, uh, in this market. All right, folks, so at the end of every show, we do the three in three, three charts in three minutes, and let's get right to it. Number one, we're gonna talk about the S&P market trend in our market recap. We looked at this long-term trend following mechanism, and again, I might be shooting myself in the foot by pointing out the fact that it potentially is triggering a, a sell signal just on one of the biggest updates we've had during this bear market period, which is just the irony of it is beautiful. But here's why I think it's still important, right? This, this model I've used for years, and it's again, it's based on how tr downtrends normally evolve and making sure that you prevent climactic losses. It's trying to get you out. The severity and time of this sell-off and price and time has been significant and has been unlike anything that I've seen before. So, you know, if the week would end right about where it is, this has turned negative. Again, whether that means we're in, you know, going into an extended further bear market period, not necessarily. The last time it actually turned negative was the beginning of December of 2018. We had a couple further down weeks, but in the end, that ended up being, you know, a fairly, fairly viable point. Uh, but I think it's worth noting, as always, I like having a systematic rules-based system behind what I'm doing as an overall bias but I am 100% gonna focus on uh, the price itself. So worth seeing how the rest of this week plays out and whether or not that's triggered to the downside. Chart number two is with uh, the relative performance of semiconductors, my guest, Rob Slimer, who I uh, have followed for years. Um, great comments about the performance of semiconductors, the fact that the, the chart's actually holding up pretty well. As you all know, we use the relative performance of semiconductors as part of our mindful investor chart list as a way to just measure you know, strength within the, uh, in the markets. This group tends to do well when the market's doing well. And on a relative basis, it's actually been flat year to date. It's been pretty choppy. Um, and in the last uh, week or so has, uh, has gone to new relative lows, which is a bit of a concern. The last couple of days, it's reversed big time to the upside, suggesting in this one data point that, uh, that things are actually holding up uh, just fine. The market has some potential upside. The last one is looking at bond prices. We didn't talk a ton about this, but I, uh, I know as I was getting ready for uh, our navigating a bear market sp uh, special coming up tomorrow, uh, I was talking about asset allocation. And so this is one of the charts that I looked at, you know, again, not paying attention to anything else, just looking at this chart of the TLT, pretty decent chart, had an exponential rise and you can just see the volatility now versus a couple months ago. Um, so it's an increased volatility as with most things, but this is something that pulled down to an increasing 200 day moving average, which lined up very well with the bottoming process from last fall, the fourth quarter of last year, since then has actually bounced back up, back above the most recent swing highs and now continues to push to the upside. So even though interest rates are lower than they have been in the longest time, and even though there's a theoretical bottoming to what in, where interest rates could go, bond prices still could go up uh, for, a, for a fairly meaningful amount uh, even within that uh, within that framework, and I think the question is obviously where where assets rotate to. This is very much an open ended question. I don't think we know the answer to that yet, uh, but I know from an asset alloc allocation perspective, there've been a lot of relative movements. I think how some of these charts evolve, things like bonds, gold, stocks, and others, that'll help us, uh, you know, hopefully fill in the blanks for the coming weeks and months. And ladies and gentlemen, that's our show for today. Thank you so much for joining us every weekday after the close for the final bar. I want to thank our guest, Rob Slimer from Funstrat, for sharing his insights on breadth and uh, semiconductors. want to remind you, please keep your questions, your feedback coming to us. The final bar at stockcharts.com is the best way to get a hold of us. As a reminder, our goal at Stockcharts is to empower you to make better decisions using charts and technical analysis. So please Help us help you. Uh, send us your questions and your feedback. Ladies and gentlemen, for StockCharts.com in Redmond, Washington, I'm Dave Keller. Have a great night.